Hi there, and welcome to the Future of Education Town Hall. I'm Christy McDonald. This program was created by Detroit Public Television and the Center for Michigan as part of the American Graduate Project. Today, we will focus on what's happening in education across the state. The future of our education system affects everyone, from parents and students to educators and employers. In January, the Center for Michigan released its report on the public's agenda for public education. It's an in-depth look at what Michigan citizens want from the education system. And as the center found in the year it spent traveling around the state, there's no shortage of ideas. It seems everyone agrees things should be changed, and some issues consistently ranked as more important than others. But just how these changes should be implemented and what it will cost is often the bigger question. So today we've convened two panels of experts to participate in a candid conversation about early childhood education and some alternate education options that are available. Before we sit down with our panelists, let's take a look at some of the questions the center asked you in this education study and some of your answers. Some of the findings might surprise you. A huge undertaking to be sure, but the Center for Michigan works to represent the voices that are often not heard. In this case, the voices of families and people with a vested interest in the state's education system. The Center began this process in early 2012. They held over 200 community conversations, including parents, students, teachers, and employers. The Center also conducted two statewide phone polls. In total, over 5,800 people participated and the report found the overall grade for the statewide system was a mediocre C. But when asked what letter grade people would give their local public education system, a bit of an improvement, the grade was a solid B. The study found a similar difference between educators and those who use the system, like parents and students. Educators were more likely to give an A or B to the statewide system, but both groups gave their local education system a better than average grade. This study also asked about how important teacher preparation was in terms of improving student learning outcomes and found about 40% of those polled thought it was crucial. That same number also thought it was important. The need for stronger support to educators was also a top priority. In fact, about 80% of those surveyed listed more support for educators as a crucial or important concern. In terms of how important it is to hold educators more accountable for student learning, the report found about 60% say this is an issue crucial or important to them. The study also asked about expanding preschool and early childhood education programs. That was cited as crucial by 45% of those surveyed and important for 30%. And that desire for expanding early childhood education is an issue that is getting a lot of attention in Lansing. The governor even talked about his commitment to early childhood education in his State of the State address. We have 29,000 students that are eligible for a program to get them into preschool. Um, I don't believe we can accomplish all of that, and I'm open to coming up with creative ideas to get there. But I think it's important we make a major commitment, a major budget commitment, to get as many kids in as possible and get us on a path to getting all those kids in great start in early childhood programs. It's a plan that many parents agree is the right choice. The most important thing to me about the early childhood education would be that it sets up your whole lifetime learning. I mean, that's where you start. That's where you, you want that good experience there. As the governor mentioned, one of the more popular early childhood education programs is called Great Start Readiness. Well, she went um, the four day a week preschool, so it was Monday through Thursday, and she had the halftime program. So that was, um, we started at 8 o'clock and went until about 11.30. This program has provided quality preschool education to over 500,000 at-risk four-year-olds since it began in 1985. Research shows students attending this program did better throughout their academic careers. And that beginning foundation actually had an impact on the rest of their educational careers and even their lives. For one family, it's a program already earning high marks. Every morning, even now, they walk down the stairs, Lily and Violet, and they count. Violet can, is two and a half. She can count to 15. And Lillian, going at a great start, there's such a growth in confidence in like articulation even. Perhaps the biggest question, how and who will pay for these programs? As part of this survey, the center did ask participants one question about money. The question, 
Do you think Michigan needs to spend more to improve education and student achievement? The answer by a wide margin, 70%, was a resounding yes. We also continue to hear them say they want to spend differently. Even after these tough budget years, there is a sense that there, there are more efficiencies to be had. Some ideas for those efficiencies included consolidation of services across districts and cost cutting in pensions and benefits. Another popular idea was streamlining regulations and the funding process from Lansing. Ultimately, the discussion will continue, but you can and should get involved. And we are focusing our first conversation today on early childhood education. As you can see, we're joined by an audience right here in our studio who will have a chance to ask questions. And just a reminder for everyone watching online or at home, you can ask questions as well. Just find us on Twitter at Center for MI and use the hashtag FutureEdMI to join the conversation. So let's start off by introducing you to our first panel. Phil Power is the founder and chairman of the Center for Michigan, the ones who crafted this year-long study of what people really think of education in the state of Michigan. Also joining us, Denise Smith. She is the vice president of Early Childhood for Excellent Schools Detroit. It's a nonprofit working to help Detroit children have a great education. Also with us is Scott Menzel, the superintendent of the Washtenaw Intermediate School District. And finally, also with us, Pat Convery, a member of the Children's Leadership Council of Michigan, which is a coalition of child advocates working to further early childhood education. All of you, thank you so much for joining us here today at Public Television. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, before we start our conversation, I want to get a little bit of context here. And Denise, can you talk to us a little bit about what Excellent, Excellent Schools Detroit actually does? Absolutely. Excellent Schools Detroit was really formed as a coalition of stakeholders, civic leaders, as well as philanthropy to drive conditions that assure that there are excellent children from cradle to career are in excellent environments by 2020. Uh, those excellent environments will be providing high quality education. And so it's become a critical component of our strive to assure that children are graduating career and college ready by that time. All right, and Pat, could you just give us a little bit about what Children's Leadership Council of Michigan does? Children's Leadership Council is a group of more than 120 business leaders across the state. It's chaired by Doug Luciani up in Traverse City and um, Debbie Dingle down here in Southeast Michigan. And our goal is to uh, get increased attention for early childhood education and early childhood care, also from cradle to, to education, and very supportive of additional funding and not keeping, uh, not balancing the education budget on the backs of early childhood. But All right, so let's, let's dive right in. Phil, talk to us about why the center decided to tackle education this year, and in particular, talking about early childhood education. Our interest in uh, early childhood education goes back about five years mm -hmm. when we talked with more than 10,000 Michigan citizens about what kind of state they wanted and what's an action plan for that kind of state. And one of the things that came to the top of the heap was improving our schools and in particular doing so by working on early childhood. Uh, the science of brain development is now very, very clear. Little kids earn, learn their best from age zero to five, and at the same time, kindergarten starts at five, and the data from the scientists and all the developmental people show that kids who go to early childhood perform far better in school, are more likely to graduate, more likely to get good jobs, less likely to get in, in jail, less likely to get into drugs. So. In a sense, early childhood really moves the needle in so many things. That, that, and, and what happened is that people who participated in our community conversations said, this is important, it's not being talked about, let's work on it. Our second phase that we did last year was 5,000 Michigan citizens talking about the public's agenda for public education and one of the top priorities, again, was early childhood. Did that surprise you? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. We don't know what those data look like while we're doing the community conversation. They're all data-based at public sector consultants, a partner in Lansing. But when the data came out, we were not surprised. And that gave us the stimulus to go to Lansing and talk with the governor and the legislature about really improving state support for the Great Start Readiness Program. Michigan spends $14 billion a year 
on K-12, but only a little more than $100 million on Great Start Readiness Program. And there are almost 30,000 kids in Michigan who qualify for this program but aren't enrolled because there aren't slots. Right. So Scott, give me an idea of some of the successes that you're seeing then in the classroom from having these kids with the Great Start Readiness Program in Washtenaw. Well, students who participate in the program uh, truly do have a, an opportunity to master the skills necessary to be successful when they enroll in kindergarten. And it's not just about kindergarten entry. This is about their entire educational career. So I want to be sure that people understand that it's not just like a, an inoculation. You, don't, you can't just give them <laughs> Great Start Readiness Preschool and then they're going to be successful. And they're done. The they're good. <laughs> it's the whole system, right? The governor talked about P20. Uh, but what we've seen is that students who participate are better prepared both from an academic perspective as well as a social-emotional perspective to learn and master what they're expected to do in kindergarten. So that's, that's significant. But as Phil was mentioning, we have a lot of students who aren't able to enroll because we don't have sufficient funding. Uh, you probably know that Washtenaw County is the home of the Perry Preschool Study, which is the most cited research about the positive impact of a high-quality preschool experience. Can you give us some details for people who may not be informed about so, it? So 50 years ago, um, a couple of visionary gentlemen decided that they were going to invest significantly for at-risk um, children of color in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and provide a high-quality preschool experience that was really focused not just on academics, but also a kind of a whole child approach. And what they've done is they've tracked the life experiences of those students throughout the last uh, 50 years to see where they ended up. And, and the evidence is overwhelmingly positive in terms of the impact, not just as they went through their educational experience, but in life in general. And so as we think about those kinds of things, this investment has, has a, a long tail in terms of the return on investment. Denise, so we hear the impact for children if they can get into these programs, but in the schools that you're working with in Detroit right now, how many of these kids are actually able to be in an early childhood in a, in a preschool pre-K environment? So the, the numbers are not where we want them to be. Um, when we look at programs who are actually providing high quality services and use the measure that the state has devised with Great Start to Quality, the tier quality rating improvement system, in Wayne County there are about 1,249 programs. Of those, only 373 are actually participating actively in Great Start to Quality. Mm. What that says is that the preparation that's needed and the environment that should be there to really engage these students correctly, the teacher effectiveness, is not happening. The environments that need to be in place are not there. Um, so the numbers of 40,000 about children in Wayne County who should be in these particular environments are not getting the care that they need. Um, when we started uh, last year and working at the state level with Great Start to Quality, we knew that there were about 60% of children who are on unlicensed care. Uh, and so Great Start to Quality Orientation started to move that needle to put more children in licensed environments. And so right now we're about at 50-50, unlicensed, licensed. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do, a lot of work to ensure that the programs that are there and existing are providing high quality service. And so that is the issue. It's also interesting because it also sounds like to me that it's also uh, somewhat of a public relations campaign. I mean, you talked, Phil, that it's been five years in the making that you've been talking about early childhood education um, and the awareness of it at the center. So, Pat, let me ask you, are we finally connecting and are we finally getting people to think about education more than just K through 12, that we are looking beyond and into these little ones to getting them prepared to when they actually do walk into kindergarten. Well, I think our governor is helping a great deal, as is Phil's group. Um, but there are still people out there that call it babysitting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's my job to raise my kids, not the state's job. Uh, and How do you answer those people? Uh, well, you talk about the changing world that we're in now. And, and from a business perspective, I'm with the Howell Area Chamber of Commerce, and our business uh, our businesses are seeing this as an economic issue to provide talented people. And right now, uh, we have so much talent that is either going someplace else or is just not here. And that's a huge issue for the entire state. Uh, if we can have our children reading at grade level at the end of third grade, that, I, that is something that uh, preschool education is really uh, helps. Then they are successful in elementary school successful in high school and then successful in college or whatever they do after college as far as technical training. These are the kind of folks that, sta that the state of Michigan needs for, needs to be a great state again. We have state representatives who 
when this conversation started, thought this was ridiculous and used terms like the nanny state. Now that they're seeing the data, and the data is so clear, they have completely done a 180 and see the value of this. Scott, what are parents saying to you? What are they asking you? Do you find that more parents are asking about preschool programs, or what does the district provide, or what can I do for my kids? Well, recognize that, that uh, most parents look for preschool opportunities for their children. And what the Great Start Readiness Program is designed to do is target those children and families where they may not have access or may not have the resources to be able to secure a quality preschool opportunity. And so our challenge is really reaching out to those families who may not know that it's available or who may not understand that, that it's important. Most of the other families are already actively seeking out opportunities for their children. And one of the challenges we have in the state is to make sure that, that uh, every child in Michigan has an opportunity to enter kindergarten ready to succeed. Right. And some don't have the same assets at home as others. And so that's part of the challenge with GSRP. And so we've got a very intentional effort to recruit families who may not understand that this is a possibility for them and that's part of what we've been doing with GSRP. Denise, how hard is it then to connect parents to what programs are available and out there? Do you find that you're constantly trying to help people say, no, this is what we have available, Let, let's get your kids there? Yes, so uh, the connections are essential um, and there is an awareness and an educational curve that needs to occur as well. So while I may be seeking the best environment for my child, it's not always with uh, the knowledge of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. What is a high quality environment? What should I be looking for when I go to these sites and visit to place my child? So there's a lot of education that needs to take place. Um, and so there are, there are tools now with Great Start Connect where you can go and find out about programs with a rating system to see where they're geared. Um, but those are on the beginning phases of it. And so we don't have enough information to actually arm our parents with it. Even with Excellent Schools Detroit, we have a report card that actually grades schools in the environments that we live, um, which will include these early learning programs as well. So we're trying to put out the tools so that parents actually have the resources to make those informed decisions. Um, but many ch parents actually choose environments based on referral. Where did my friend go? Right. And those kinds of relationships. So we want them to be more savvy consumers in looking at other things other than what my friend said was a good environment to really determine the best placement that's going to really push those children. Yeah, and sometimes that's sometimes the only information that they have to go on. That's right. yeah. um, so Phil, let me ask you this. Are we starting to change the way that we think about education as parents, um, about when education should start, how education should look for our kids? We have um, sadly split education into little silos pre-K, K-12, community colleges, four-year, vocational. And, and what that's done is set up turf between and fights between each of these little silos when actually what we're talking about is how do you invest in human skills and capability and experience and insight and how do you get a competitive, productive workforce to make this state go forward? And what's beginning to happen is people are realizing that we're not talking about just one piece of schools. We're talking about how do you invest mm -hmm. in human capital to make everybody better and make the state prosper. This takes a long time, but I think in talking with the legislature, and right now we are talking with the legislature about substantially increasing state support for the Great Start Readiness Program, and legislators are beginning to realize that parents understand that early childhood is critical to their kids and that the kids who need it the most, poor kids, minority kids, kids from broken families, are those who aren't getting the kinds of educational experience they need and they're the kind of kids who need the help the most and that's what we're all about. All right, so you started the money conversation. I had the money conversation. Probably a couple more questions down, <laughs> Phil. I, I yeah, have to jump right. on it now because, well, again, it's a, big deal. it's a big deal because you talk about education, and it is about the children, and right. it is about making sure that they've got curriculum and they've got the tools to learn, but it also does come down to money, mm -hmm. and it comes down to how much money mm -hmm. there is and how much money is it going to take to pay for certain programs and who's going to get it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very interesting you talk about the silos, and if you start up, is there any kind of um, competition between your K through 
through 12s and looking for that state funding and, oh, and college and now pre K is coming into it. So let's back up and let's talk about the governor's proposed $130 million for the mm -hmm. Great Start Readiness Program mm -hmm. over a couple of years. Scott, what was your reaction to that when you heard that? So first, I was encouraged by that investment. We've known for a long time that at, at, at it's the most conservative estimate that for every dollar you invest in early childhood, you save $7 in other costs that we spend down the road. Cost in terms of uh, remediation in school, cost in terms of retention in grade. Last year alone, uh, 100 and, I'm trying to remember the numbers, 13,000 kindergarten students, right. $100 million worth of, of state aid that went to students who repeated kindergarten. So we're going to spend the money one way or the other. What we know is that if we invest on the front end, we're going to save money on the back end because we're not going to have some of those additional costs that are associated with not uh, spending on the front end. So it's about how we prioritize our resources. And the fact that the governor acknowledged that this investment was one of the most important we can make, given the data, it was very encouraging from my perspective. And what were your thoughts, Pat? Absolutely. We've been uh, talking about that $130 million at the Cheaters Children's Leadership Council. And... Uh, it was wonderful to hear that come from the podium of, at the governor's uh, state of the uh, or budget presentation. Um, and now, you know, we're waiting and seeing. Now there's a lot of uh, work that Phil's doing, our legislators are doing, people like Scott are doing, the Children's Leadership Council is doing to, to see how much of that becomes reality. That, that $100 million uh, number that Scott just quoted is just stunning to me when I first discovered it, that for the kids that have to do kindergarten one more time. It costs us a hundred million dollars. That's just, I mean, there's most of the money right there. If we could cut that down even by half, it's that's, a, it's a that's staggering, 50, it's, it's a, a staggering, staggering amount. And you know, I'm, I'm going to jump in here, there's, but there's one other cost with early childhood that um, you don't hear too much about, is getting the children to early childhood. Mm -hmm. The transportation issues. In districts like ours that are semi-rural, everybody, most everybody, needs a school bus or needs a parent to take the child to school. Well, if the parent is working, which we all want the parents to do, there's an issue. What about afterwards when the parent is still working? Who cares for the child? So it, it is a difficult situation, and that's one of the reasons why not all the children who may be eligible, even if the money is there, will partake in this because of those other obstacles. So um, we talk about the work that's going on in Lansing now and, and people are talking about this. Denise, is there any kind of collaboration between organizations like yours and mm -hmm. like Pat's? What kind of um, coalition is there among the groups saying, hey, let's all of us who are fighting for uh, early childhood education, uh, we are all going to get together and we're going to lobby in a certain way. What kind of coordination can you share with us? So one of our efforts at Excellence Schools Detroit is a Drive Detroit initiative. Um, where we're actually doing just that. So it's about bringing together all those involved, um, all those interested parties, to ensure that we're talking about not only a policy platform, but what are the programming and interventions that need to be there to assure that our children are on this trajectory of, of graduating and career ready. Um, so with Drive Detroit, we look at indicators across the continuum of cradle to career to really guide us to see if we're making the moves that are necessary to put those children in the right place. And that is a coalition of, of civic and philanthropy working together to see that that happens. Mm -hmm. I think on a broader scale, when we're talking about really looking at um, advocacy and, and making sure that, that the things are happening for our young children, uh, we have the Great Start Network um, where we have the collaboratives and others at, with who are working with, this, for example, the um, Power Rally that happens every year, Star Power, and really bringing to the attention of legislators what it is that we need for our young children. All right, so Phil, go ahead. This, I don't mean to jump mm -hmm. in, but one of the things that's really striking about discussions about early childhood in Lansing with elected officials is how much this is not a partisan issue. Right. There are Republicans who love it. There Absolutely. are Democrats who love it. There are mugwumps and independents who love it. <laughs> and and so now that we're calling anybody any names <laughs> here, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but but I, I guess the point is, in in these debates, so much the debate has been about adults, and who controls what, and not about kids. Are they willing to spend the money, though, Phil? The short answer is yes, because the return on investment in early child. Yeah. Is so enormous. There's an economic yeah. case for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, definitely. And I think that's been the, the biggest assist to our actually mm -hmm. seeing movement. Absolutely. Um, if we look at a Wilder report that came out last year for a single early learner, the return on investment is $100,000. That's one child. 
And so it's magnificent when you think about investing that money early as opposed to mm -hmm. using it later for right. remediation, sure. that it, it is the best choice to make. So what is happening right now in Lansing that you can tell us about, Phil? Come on, right give us now, some backroom yeah. conversations. Uh, well, the backroom conversations are taking place right now as we are talking because the legislative subcommittees met yesterday and today on the question of shall, as the governor has proposed, the state increase budget for early childhood uh, programs uh, by about uh, $180 million, which is in effect tripling over two years the amount of money that is now spent. And there are arguments, and there always will be, because making legislation is just like making sausages. Mm -hmm. it's, it's complicated, and you don't want to look at it. You don't it. really want to see the process. But, but one of the things that is coming out is that some people are saying, well, we don't need early childhood because the evidence about Head Start right. is that it doesn't have much of a long effect. Head Start is the federal program that aims at people who are at the federal poverty level. The Great Start Readiness Program is the state's program that aims at kids two and three times the federal poverty level. And there is a fair amount of research saying that some Great Start, some Head Start programs work very well and some don't work so well. But the research and the data about the Great Start Readiness Program, Michigan's own program, which we designed and which we administer here in Michigan, mm -hmm. is that it is very effective kids graduate quicker, the return on investment is enormous, and so attacking Head Start right. as a way to beat up on Great Start readiness doesn't make any sense at all. Right. Okay, so we heard the President talk about that in his right. State of the Union address, right. Scott. So clear that up, clear the differences up, and do you have confusion from parents saying, well, wait, if, if we're going to get this federal program, what's this different from the state program? Help us out. Well, in terms of the, the president's proposal, he wanted to partner with states in terms of expanding preschool access. And so Michigan, I would think, would be in a prime position with our increased investment in the Great Start Readiness Program to receive supplemental federal funds if, if they were to materialize. And I don't want to speculate given sequestration and, and the, yeah. the that's federal a, budget challenges. That's a whole different show, Scott, actually. I'm <laughs> so, not quite sure we have uh, so, the time for so that. I don't think we'd, we'd, we'd put all our eggs in that basket, but to say, there's an opportunity, really. We know that with a high-quality Great Start Readiness Preschool program, the results speak for themselves. We've followed a full cohort through graduation. We know that they're more likely to graduate on time, that they're less likely to be retained in grade, that they outperform students who didn't have a Great Start Readiness Preschool experience on the state's assessments in third grade. So as, as we look at that data, there are opportunities to partner with Head Start programs to blend and braid the funding where if you have a half-day Head Start program and a half-day Great Start Readiness program, we can give the students who are most at risk a full-day high-quality preschool experience that will help ensure that they're ready to succeed when they move into the traditional system. Right. Okay. Pat, let me ask you as we kind of look in our crystal ball a little bit, um, where are we going to be, do you think, in five years? Where would you like to see us? Mm. in terms of wow. early childhood. I know, I'm, I'm letting you go whole hog. Here. Well, we have a big, hairy, audacious goal in Livingston County uh, that came out of our strategic growth plan called Advantage Livingston. And we uh, decided that we wanted to have early childhood education available uh, for every child, rich, poor, uh, middle, uh, that it would just be part of the culture in Livingston County. Do you think it's possible? Absolutely. Anything is possible. And there is so much passion out there now. We have, you're talking about collaboration. We have pretty much everybody at the table on this. We have business, we have education, we have uh, people who are providing, uh, providing these kind of services both privately and publicly. And we also have some corporations who see this as valuable. Uh, how we're going to fund it, we're not at that point yet. We did get a little bit of funding that we're going to be doing some pilot programs. Uh, but yes, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see that this, this would be as normal as, as going to kindergarten when you're five years old. All right, so uh, Denise, I'm going to give you the same question then. Sure. What would you like to see or what do you project that is doable in the next five years? Yeah. So I would, um, I would want and hope that both the governor and the president's pledges are realized. Um, and with that blending funding, that allows opportunities not just for four-year-olds, but for children from birth all the way to five. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know that 90% of the brain, child's brain architecture is formed between zero and three, so just to leave it to four-year-olds is not enough. 
Um, so having those two in effect would essentially give us that broader spectrum, which is th what we need. Um, I would add to that that we also look to increase teacher effectiveness by giving them the supports that they need. Yeah. I would argue that that's probably the biggest difference between Great Start Readiness and Head Start, that they have ongoing coaching and development, and that's what you need after a seminar, after a conference, someone to be there to really watch it, what you're doing and assist you in becoming better. And as someone who's in the system right now and working with those teachers, what what is your uh, projection the next couple of years, what you'd like to see? Well, well, the increased investment is important, but it's really about a commitment of the state of Michigan to support every child, to ensure that regardless of the circumstances of their birth, they're given an opportunity to be successful and to develop their full potential. That's why people go into the teaching profession. It's why people commit their careers to public education. And this investment needs to start before kindergarten. It really needs to be from birth all the way through the educational process. And, and I think we have an opportunity to, to truly create that system. Yeah, I think you're right. We need to kind of start, stop thinking of it as K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, Phil, you want to give your projection for the next couple of years? Here's a quick thought. Mm -hmm. There are states that predict the needs that they have to put people in yes. prison yes. based on third grade reading this scores. Is very interesting, right? That's such a simple way to say how important this is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would hope, Christy, in five years that we would do away with the silos, that we would begin to say that the most important investments that we can make as a state for our future prosperity are in the skills and brain and talent and abilities of all of our citizens. If that is the fundamental basis of making a prosperous state, we need to recognize it, we need to fit, quit fighting and squalling about it and having turf fights, and we need to recognize that there's a difference between sensible, tough-minded investments which return and just yelling about it. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? We're going to open it up now to questions. We have a great audience here sitting with us and who have been ready to ask their questions of our panel. So we have a first question over here. Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. Tell us your name and where you're from and your question. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Ayana Knox Potts. Um, I'm in Rochester, Michigan, um, mother of six, and I have a huge concern about having access to the information needed for our children to get the requirements prior to kindergarten. Where are we to find that information before they even start kindergarten? Outside of the so-called child care and things like that, we don't even have the adequate materials to know the requirements currently in our educational system. That's a fair question. Who wants to take that? I, I can speak to a, a, a couple uh, things to, right. to point to. The state's in the process of adopting and formalizing the early learning standards mm -hmm. uh, so that, that uh, the State Board of Education is supposed to do that this month. So that information will be available on the Michigan Department of Education website. Uh, locally, within each ISD where you operate the Great Start Readiness programs, there will be information available about expectations and, and program opportunities. And in the governor's budget proposal, he's looking at a 2% set aside for outreach and recruitment so that we can actually get information into the hands of parents as they're thinking about how to best ensure that their children are prepared. In addition to that, there are two websites that you might be able to go to, which is Great Start Connects and Great Start Quality, and they do provide resources and information about what a quality environment is. Excellent. Great question. Thank you. All right, go ahead, sir. Hey, how are you today? Good, thank you. Go ahead and tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name is Daryl Stanbro, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my question was how, because of uh, the diversity in Southeast Michigan, um, some cultures don't necessarily want their students in school before the age of five. So how would you provide the resources so they can see and understand the benefits of education as far as, far as being at home or not going to school? Mm -hmm. Who wants to tackle that? So Scott, you're, you you're saying how, how to uh, teach, the, teach the parents to teach the child or how to encourage the child the teach how to encourage the parents to bring their children to Well, just kind of cultivate the skill sets while they're at home if they don't want to go to public school initially. Sure. And then once they get to kindergarten, how um, then they'll be able to adapt or acclimate easier versus missing school from zero to sure. four or five years old. I know there are a lot of great resources online for, uh, for that, but I'm not the expert in that area. I just wanted to clarify the question. <laughs> well, so, I don't think anybody is, is saying as a requirement that all right. children ought to go to preschool. That's a decision the parents are going to make. Yes. And it's going to be an informed decision about whether they feel this is better done at home 
been in some other kind of environment. The, a, a key thing, however, when it gets to parents is that from the very beginning of a child's life, if parents are involved in reading with their child, playing with their child, holding their child, engaging with their child, that is going to make absolutely the difference. And once you get to that point, it is pretty, pretty clear that early childhood programs bear a tremendous uh, return for parents. But some parents may say, no, we don't want to do that. Okay, we shouldn't force them. But I think at the end of the day, the evidence is going to be so clear that these programs work that most parents are going to want to engage in them. Okay, we have another question. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Well, thank you. Go ahead and tell us who you are. My name is Glenna Fritz. I'm from Brighton, Michigan. Product of Detroit Public Schools, a retired high school teacher of 37 years. Mm -hmm. Have lived in Washtenaw County, currently in Livingston County, mm -hmm. and I'm passionate <laughs> right. about education. Excellent. Um, I, we're all aware that children mimic adult behaviors and learn very early on from, from what they're exposed to, mm -hmm. both at home and in the grocery store or at daycare, wherever. Um, I work in the field of personal finance education, and I'd like to ask anyone on the panel how you feel about incorporating financial literacy into early childhood education. I would love to respond to that. We actually, in Washtenaw County, have a grant from PNC Bank to do just that. Hmm. So we've been incorporating financial literacy in our uh, Head Start and GSRP programs across Washtenaw County this last year uh, in order to be able to build a solid foundation so that the fundamentals of uh, personal finance are a part of what's included in the preschool experience. Uh, but we're also partnering with the families because many families need that support as well. So it's a great opportunity to build that capacity both for the young children as well as their families. That's, what does that curriculum look like? What, like, what are they actually well, doing? Well, it's very intentional. There, there are some things in terms of it's save, share, or spend, mm -hmm. right? And so you're, they're, they're learning at a, at a preschool age. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty simple conceptually, but it's, a, it's something that, you know, if you spend it, you don't have it. And so they're learning that, <laughs> you know, there's only so much to go around uh, if, you, if you save it or share it because we want to also encourage the, the opportunity to give. And so thinking through all of those things, it's, it's a creative way to approach it. And we were really grateful to PNC for providing the funding to do that as a as Wow, a that's program. excellent. Yeah. Oh, I hope, I hope other districts hear that right, <laughs> from right. you or hear this right now. Because I have a four-year-old. That sounds all right. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that. All right, uh, go ahead. Hi, ma'am. My name is Dr. Stephanie Biasi, and I'm from Midland, Michigan. And my question is related to K-12 things. Why is it that student evaluations are based on one standardized test score rather than comparing a baseline score that might be done initially with subsequent scores so that districts can be looked at as to improving the, the student's um, work? Well, I, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I'm so glad Scott's here. Yeah, I, so so I, I, would, I would give you a, a couple of responses to that. One, we know that, that for ease of, of uh, reporting purposes, MEEP scores get right. overemphasized. Right. But from a school perspective, we really are interested in that growth data. Mm -hmm. And as we're moving towards the Smarter Balance Assessment, which will be implemented in 2014, we're going to be looking at individual growth over time rather than just that single point in time assessment. Uh, so we're having a, a more sophisticated approach to assessment and student growth than what we've previously had. So that is, I think, in process and something that will be very important because regardless of where a student starts, what we want to truly determine is did they make progress over the course of that, that year of education and instruction. And I think the tools to be able to do that are, are in the works. Mm -hmm. There's a fair amount of thought going into this right now. The dean of the University of Michigan School of Education, Deborah Ball, is leading a group that is trying to figure out how best to evaluate the growth that kids have in schools and get off this business in which only one standardized right. test is the only thing that matters. Right. Right. And I would offer with what we're doing um, with the Drive Detroit is really looking at a number of indicators, not just MEEP scores. So our report card does look at growth data and all those things and beginning to even d determine how we can look at grit as a component of children's success. All right, all right, we have another question over here. Hi, how are you? Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Zygmunt Kaziki, and I'm with the Central Michigan University Global Campus, and I teach in Livonia. So this is kind of a global question, if you, you can conceptualize that. But what can we do to move or advance past the agrarian farm-based <laughs> school <laughs> schedule into a more contemporary modern school schedule? 
And the caveat to this is having studied school systems throughout the world, uh, they've moved away from the agrarian model or are rapidly moving away from it. And yet I, I see for some reason we're still struggling with this whole concept. Change. You know what, uh, you talked about that the center as part of the study talked about um, should we be, do a year-round school and we were going to touch on that a little bit in the next panel, but Phil, go ahead and talk about that right now. The results actually surprised me. It, it's <clears throat> a lot of people have said, why have uh, two or three months break in the summer mm -hmm. uh, when kids uh, are supposed to be out of school? And in the 19th century, they went back to the farm and helped with getting the crops sure. in and doing the work. The data are pretty clear that children forget a lot yeah. over that summer period, especially poor and vulnerable children. Mm -hmm. And so there is a thought, gee, change this, let's have year-round school, let's get away from this model. We asked that question in the Center for Michigan's community conversations and inquired exactly about that school schedule. And frankly, we were surprised that there didn't seem to be very much interest in it. We expected that parents were going to say, well, this is a good idea, uh, kids forget too much. I suspect that part of what's going on is that a lot of families have organized their time and their calendars to spend the summer with their kids. Kids go to camp, families plan vacations, on and on. So there's a conflict between family, culture, and habit and some of the educational performance issues yeah. that get involved. Did that su surprise any of you that, that people really weren't looking towards an alternative calendar at all? No, it, it, it wasn't surprising. Uh, I mean, quite frankly, if you think about it, if, if parents were demanding it, school boards would have adopted it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's right? it parent driven, I think. Yeah. yeah. And no, it's not surprising, but I think what we need to do is to provide more data to substantiate mm -hmm. why it needs to be done. A little bit and more information. Yeah, then. yeah. nationwide they're looking at summer reading loss. Mm -hmm. And so I mm -hmm. think those kinds mm -hmm. of um, data points will assist parents and others in knowing why, what is it, my child is bringing home to the individual losing during this period when in fact he could be gaining. Do you talk about that in, in the schools at all, Scott? I mean, uh, is September and October, are they kind of termed catch-up time when you, when you start back up at school? Or how would you, how, it really how becomes, is that discussed? It really becomes meet preparation time because the state assessment's in October. Yeah. Right. And so, and students are being assessed on what they learned in the prior year. Is that poor timing? It's, I think it's poor timing. I'd <laughs> rather have the, the assessment at the end of the Gee, instructional cycle instead of, you know, after a summer where kids have been away from the process. Yeah. So that's part of it. And then we've, at least in Washtenaw County, with the consolidation of Ypsilanti and Willow Run Public Schools, the community actually was open to this notion of a balanced calendar and understanding the importance for the students and addressing achievement issues. So I think, you know, there will be pockets of, of places where schools will mm -hmm. move towards a balanced calendar. And as you demonstrate success and people see that you can still have time off to do mm -hmm. things right. in the summer as well as other times throughout the calendar, we might be able to see that shift. But it's a difficult concept for some. Uh, as they're thinking about making the shift wholesale. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, you know, we have been asking people for their questions on Twitter. People are watching us online as well, and we appreciate that. So we do have a Twitter question from Monica Williams from Southeast Michigan. At the center, what initiatives exist in Michigan that include students in the planning and conversations about their education? Phil, you want to take that? We specifically aimed our community conversations at the customers of the school's industry which is to say students, parents, and employers. And if you think about all the fighting that's going on in Lansing about schools and everything else, usually customers of the school system aren't involved. And we aimed our conversation specifically to include students, parents, and employers. And, and as, we, as we looked at the demographic profile of people who participate in age, in gender, in race, and in geography, the people who participate in our community conversations look almost exactly like the diversity of the reality of Michigan. And I was particularly interested in those conversations that reached out to students, right. because a lot of students said, nobody's asking us what we think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, we have another question here in studio. Hi, sir, go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, Chuck Fellows. I'm from the Brighton area. I'm president of the FlexTech Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And as a board, we have two responsibilities. One is, is the money there? The other, are the children learning? And my question is to Phil's original point. We spend $14 billion in the state of Michigan on education. Nationally, 
the United States of America spends the most money on education of any country in the world, specifically the OECD countries, 31 members. In the OECD countries, they spend 70 to 80 percent of their education dollars in the classroom. In the United States, we only spend 50 percent. Mm -hmm. My question is, where's the other seven billion dollars? Well, here's a quick comment. In Michigan, uh, the notion was that the school year was 180 days. The legislature changed the way we denominate the school year. Instead of days, it went to hours. hours. And lots of local school boards said, well, heck, we're trying to cut a deal with the local unions. We don't have any money. The easy way to do this is knock 20 minutes off this day, 20 minutes off that week, and we can cut the deal. The net effect, and we did the research, was that the average in Michigan for the length of the school year is 165 days translated to hours. Now, compare this with other nations. What's the standard in Europe? 200 days. What's the standard in Japan? 225. What's the standard in Korea? Almost 230. My son lives in Shanghai where he's involved in teaching languages. He says that in China it's 240, 250, and still they want to do more. So we expect our kids to go to school for 165 days in Michigan and compete with the rest of the world. And I think there's a relationship between the amount of time that you spend in class, precisely the question, and what you learn. And we're going to have to move on this and, and, and get with the program, otherwise our kids are going to fall behind. I didn't want to add to that. Or? Well, I would just say that the numbers vary depending on where you are in the state. And so if you're in Livingston County, that uh, number in terms of direct classroom expenditure is 60 to 65 percent by district of the five in Livingston County. And, and uh, if you think about the other requirements, just transportation alone, the Howell Public School District has 156 square miles. They're spending a lot of money on transportation that districts in Metro Detroit that only have a few square miles don't have to spend. And so the, the reality, economic reality, is that there are a lot of support services for what's happening in the classroom that take up a, a, the other portion of those resources. All right, we have another question from our Twitter followers. So why don't we go ahead and head to that. I don't have that. I don't have that actually right now. We, we lost that, but we uh, so appreciate people who are watching us online right now for our conversation. You know, I think it's interesting, Phil, that you bring up a lot of those statistics and, and how it breaks down and how actually our, our classroom hours are spent as opposed, to, as opposed to days. Do you think getting that information out to parents could change these conversations that we're having right now? Over the long run, I believe it will. Uh, part of the problem is that those who make the decisions about how money is allocated, whether for education or for other purposes, in the legislature, they are lagging institutions. They, they, they don't lead the public. Just as Scott said, if our parents in our district wanted to change the school calendar, we'd change it. So I think that at the end of the day, we're going to have to concentrate on providing information for parents about how schools work, about how kids get investment in their capacity, what it means to their careers, and what it means for the prosperity of the state. And when that educational message gets across, the people who make the decisions about how to re align resources are going to follow. Is that also, a, a, I guess, also looking at priorities? Too. I mean, what's the most important message to try to get out right now? And you have to, you have to kind of put on the line. Well, that might not be the most important thing. The most important thing right now is got to make sure that parents know what resources they have to get their kids into school and to get their kids to school every day. Right, right. And along with that comes really creating a true value proposition around education and doing it longer. I was watching uh, Condoleezza Wright a few years ago, and, and she stated that the biggest threat to our national security is not bombs and missiles, but the fact that we're an illiterate nation mm -hmm. in comparison. Mm -hmm. And so we need to invest in right. creating more investments in children so that, they, that that no longer exists. In Michigan, there are 70,000 jobs that we can't fill because right. it's more technical than the skill sets Absolutely. that our that our nation and our our state has right now. It's a huge okay. skill set. We've got uh, another question from Twitter. Here it is from Gary Nayart. He says, is the Great Start Readiness Program an essential program to prepare pre-K kids for, quote, nanny state government daycare? 
Now, I don't know how, how you, how, who wants to answer that, Pat? You want to take no, a crack at that? Or, um, no, that's a term we've heard, isn't it? Right. Well, first, But it's out there. And well, no. I think that, that uh, that's part of uh, addressing what some of the feelings Absolutely. are of, about what they're hearing. Absolutely. And, and to re re reiterate what Phil said before, this is not, uh, our idea of preschool is not a, a requirement. You, d you must attend preschool. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of parents out there that are doing an excellent job with their children and have the resources, the time to uh, prepare their children for school. Uh, this is a great alternative for many children. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe in the nanny state. Um, I'd like to hear some other comments. I, I'm sure, Scott, you've heard this a lot mm -hmm. as well. Well, my, my sense and my response would be is that most parents who have resources are actually paying to send their children to yeah. preschool. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That's true. And right. so they have that choice. That's but right. there are so many children in families that don't have access mm -hmm. to those resources that the state's going to pay one way or the other. If we don't invest in the Great Start Readiness Program, right. we're going to pay in the cost of remediation, retention in grade level, or in the criminal justice system. And so it's not really a nanny state. It's about saying that every child, regardless of the circumstance of their birth, deserves to have an opportunity to be successful when they enter into kindergarten. And if the people who have resources are exercising the choice to enroll their kids in a quality preschool, why shouldn't the kids why who, through no fault of their own, are right. born into families that can't do that have that same opportunity? That's exactly right. I yes. would, I would that, concur. That's 100%. exactly it. Yeah, yes. That is it. Uh, families with resources can pay on average $1,600 a month for care. Mm -hmm. And that's a high quality situation where you have credentialing of, of staff, higher ratios of adults to children, um, and it is not affordable by your average person, your average worker. Well, Even well, when you come down to $800 a month, um, which is the average you know, mean, you're still out of range for many who are making $7, $8 an hour to be able to send their children to those environments. Right? Well, what's yeah. the number of, of parents who are able to afford preschool for their kids? 90% of them save and spend the money to go to preschool. Go to preschool. So that says two kinds of things. Number right. one, most parents know that preschool is important. Mm -hmm. Second, we cannot have a system in which we, or we ration investments in children just according as whether people can afford Absolutely. to get their kids to preschool. Right. Absolutely. That's right. We're not talking daycare here, too. Mm -hmm. People confuse the two. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about, you know, warehousing children. Uh, as some people, perhaps our, our tweeter would say, uh, from morning till night, five days a week, so we can create a nanny state. We're, we're talking about preschool education, three, four days, afternoons in some cases, a, a, a week uh, for kindergarten readiness. Mm -hmm. All right, well, as we, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, so let's go ahead and I'm going to let each one of you uh, kind of wrap up a little bit of what we've, we've talked about here today and um, your focus and what people you think should take away from our discussion on early childhood. Go ahead, Scott. I'm going to start with you. Well, uh, I'm excited about the opportunity that Michigan will actually invest in, in uh, what is probably the most important investment we can make, and that is our children, and especially young children. I think that's part of the takeaway, that we would like to ensure that the legislature delivers on the governor's proposal and actually makes the investment. Uh, secondly, it's more than just um, the quality preschool experience. That's, that's one piece, but it's really the entire system. And providing support for children's and uh, children and family from cradle to career, not in a nanny state approach, but in a sense that we want to help ensure that they're all successful. It's vital to Michigan's future. Phil talks about having a prosperous state. Um, th this investment's critical, but it's a part of that larger conversation. And so I hope that people will continue to engage as we work to ensure that all children have an opportunity to be successful in the system. This investment in the, in the Great Start Readiness Program is a really important first step. We've known that it pays significant dividends, and, and I'm excited that that could really become a reality. Okay. Pat, go ahead. Well, of course, I'd, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> what he said, yes. <laughs> what he said is great. Oh, no, you can't. You don't get away yeah. that easy. You don't get away <laughs> that easy. <laughs> Well, I just think it is so encouraging to hear these discussions going on, um, not only at the, s at the state level, but uh, in Lansing, but among people like us. And, and it's very encouraging to me to see business leaders, you know, raising the flag about this. Uh, and I'm hoping that everyone that is l uh, watching this and, and here in our audience will bring this back to their own communities and find out what's, what's going on and learn more uh, to spread the word. This is an amazing economic infrastructure issue we have. This is as vital as roads, as uh, water, as sewer. It, this 
this creates our Michigan mm -hmm. in 15 years from now. The other thing I, I want people to take away is unlike some other things like building a bridge, and believe me, I'm all about that. We're, we're building one in our community right now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a quick fix. And, and that is one of the selling points that is missing from this that we'll never be able to say, you know, okay, your child's going to go to preschool and tomorrow things will be better. This is a long range. No guarantees. Mm -hmm. This is an investment, a long range investment. And those are sometimes more difficult to sell than you know, the, the infrastructure program that, you know, we'll build it and tomorrow, tomorrow will be better. So we need to keep that in mind. All right. Denise, yeah. go ahead. Sure. I, I think I would leave that. We know that high quality early learning experiences really can change a child's life. I mean, not only helps prepare them to be ready and successful at kindergarten and beyond, but has resounding long-term positive effects for our community. Uh, and so with that in mind, knowing that even if you decide to leave as a parent, have your child and homeschool them and there was other opportunities, to take advantage of, of finding out what's appropriate to lay those foundations. So those first three years are critical to laying foundation for future mm -hmm. success. And so it's a partnership between parents mm -hmm. and the educator. And so the last thing I would say is that we need to think very intentionally about how we support our educators to become the very best um, to ensure that we're preparing our children and our future. Okay, Phil, last word from you. Let's be tough-minded about this. Resources are scarce. We're talking about taxpayers' money. We're trying to figure out how best to allocate it to the place where it gets the greatest return on right. investment. Mm -hmm. The data are very clear. Investing in early childhood gets you returns of eight to one. You don't have as many people getting into trouble. You don't have kids who are repeating grades. You have kids who graduate from school. You have kids who don't get into criminality. You have kids who have safe and steady marriages. All of the social costs added up. When you look at investing one dollar in early childhood gets you the return of eight. And I defy anybody in Lansing to show me public expenditures which get the people of Michigan an eight to one return on investment. Mm -hmm. All right, and we'll have to end it there. I'd like to thank the panelists for joining me for a great conversation.